Hi, my name is Tanya Melnichuk. I'm the founder of the Autistic Strategies Network. I live in South Africa, where I'm also a board member of the Western Cape Network on Disabilities, which is a cross-disability organization looking at the rights of people within our province. I'd like to share a few things about one of my focus areas, uh, which is autistic health. And specifically in the light of some things which have been coming out in research and the trends that autism research is taking, which in some ways are pretty reactionary. This is an area that a lot of activists shy away from because there's so much pathologization happening in the area of autistic health. A lot of it really does have a strong eugenic slant. It's not a mistake, but it's almost at times not even my biggest concern about what's happening in there. So let me give you some specifics and I'll just focus on those two for now and also what we as activists could be doing about that. Recently, The Lancet published a recommendation to include profound autism as a new category in of autism and that this should be in the DSM. To differentiate between people who have high support needs and those who do not is in essence not a bad idea if one identifies what the support needs actually are. But here we've had a bunch of scientists who have essentially not seen the important role that they play in damaging human rights by the way in which they frame things and by the recommendations which they give which are entirely unscientific and I want to explain those very specifically. The definition of profound autism maybe summarize what they wanted to adopt is that it's somebody who uh, cannot communicate using speech that needs round-the-clock support and that has an intellectual disability. Now the problem with that definition is that intellectual disability is actually quite hard to prove when you're dealing with people who have, for example, movement and in inhibition disorders. And there is only now some research which is being done, for example, at Wilgo Lab in the UK on ascertaining if somebody cannot communicate in any way, how do we know that they can understand what's going on? Now, in other words, to be able to test for profound autism, to be able to test whether somebody who is not speaking, who is not able to communicate, um, whether they, they have an intellectual disability as well. The, you would need to put kind of like probes on someone's head in some way which doesn't actually exist yet. It's under development. So what is going to happen if this profound autism thing gets adopted? is that people who don't have an intellectual disability will end up being denied access to communication. Not that those with intellectual disability should be denied access to communication. The communication form is just different. But there is a, basically a silencing of non-speakers which is happening in this way. Now, even if somebody does not understand speech, and there are examples of that among our non-speakers who now have some even university certificates, uh, Dan Bergman comes to mind, for example, he didn't understand speech until he was about 12 years old because he actually wasn't stimulated in a way that, that really engendered that. You could test somebody, find that they don't understand speech, and then you deny them communication. You know, there's just a host of problems that happen with that kind of defining of things. These people got Alex Planck, who doesn't communicate with non-speakers, to kind of like be on the... Uh, he's an autistic guy, by the way, in advocacy the founder of Wrong Planet. Um, yeah, so he came onto the like consortium of people, uh, from what I can see, token autistic, because he didn't have any other academic credentials listed there. Whereas there are many autistic academics who potentially could have been on the group or advising there. But the group was basically, um, it's being led, and the whole movement to get this adopted is being led by the Semmel Institute. Now, who are the Semmel Institute? They are the direct descendants uh, of Lavas, they see themselves as that. Uh, Eva Lavas, the you know guy who got everybody to be ABA for the next uh, several decades, and they are perpetuating ABA. That's really what's happening there. In their report, they are praising ABA, saying how ABA is the right answer for these people. Now, if you take a, a look like a, at a guy like Alex G. Who, who was judged as being intellectually disabled, put through all these rounds. You know, the, what he says about this approach is the problem is 
You get judged as intellectually disabled because you can't communicate. So you get thrown into ABA, which is supposed to improve your skills. The fact that you are not improving proves that um, that uh, ABA is necessary. So you get thrown back into ABA, which doesn't work for you anyway. You know, you get into this vicious cycle. Okay. So if we take a look at what they're doing there, saying that this group exists by not listening whatsoever to people like the aforementioned and the many other non-speaking uh, activists who've said we were misjudged what you think works for us does not in fact work for us aba doesn't work for us we need, need a different approach to communication etc 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 so these eminent scientists who are not taking a human rights approach frame the problem incorrectly and so therefore they frame the solution incorrectly as well but even if they are not listening much just from a different kind of distanced scientific perspective there is a big problem with their conclusion about how ABA should be the solution for this and let me explain many of these scientists are involved in consortia which do genetic research so they are discovering which genes are associated with the likeliness of becoming autistic or to frame it in their way with autism risk and I could go into a lot of detail, which I'm not going to do today, but about the benefits of understanding what our genes are as autistic people. Because once you know, you know, if you've got some gene variants or some gene mutations, you could potentially optimize your lifestyle. Maybe you need to eat differently. Maybe you need to exercise differently. There are all sorts of things that you could do to make your life better. Just like anybody, autistic or non-autistic for that matter, who has some gene tests done because they're suspecting a health problem might be related to a genetic issue. So genomic research and gene research in itself is not necessarily bad. But what's happening here in this gen genomic research is they're researching all this. They're finding that, yes, these, these, these things are linked to a likeliness of being autistic. Um, and they're not always even that many. Some of them might be idiopathic autism. It's like where you look at the genes and say, well, I don't know why this person is autistic. But yeah, sure. Okay, so in some cases, we sort of see trends. These people are more likely to turn out autistic. And then they do a wholly unscientific leap when they find these sets of genes. And because you've got guys like uh, Daniel Geshwind from also associated with the same Semmel Institute, that university, um, or traditionally a pusher of ABA, they find all of these genes and then they kind of like do this leap of thinking like, oh, um, because we found these genes, therefore these guys need ABA now. Now, that there's absolutely nothing scientific about that. Let me explain. In 2021, a scientist by the name of Elizabeth Torres, she is with the New Jersey Autism Center of Excellence. She took a look at some of these databases of genes. Uh, you know, the, the various ones of them have got large numbers of autistic people's genes which have been collected over these various different genomic projects. And she took a look at if you take these unusual genes, in other words, the mutations, uh, the gene variants, which are not so common, and you take a look at people who don't have an autism diagnosis, but who have that gene mutation, what does it translate to when you translate it, for example, into anomalies or disorders or diseases? So looking at those disorders and diseases and so on, and you're coming up with movement disorders, coming up with let's say, seizures, blah, 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 a whole bunch of things. Now these, uh, taking a look at it in non-autistic people who have some of the same gene variants. What are the therapies that are prescribed for people with this enormous variety, because there's a really big variety of diseases and disorders? Do they get ABA? No, they don't. It's not standard to treat something that is like a movement disorder as though it's a behavioral problem. It's not standard to treat seizures, to treat um, emotional dysregulation. Uh, well, in fact, it is becoming common to treat some of these things with behavioral prescriptions because the organizations pushing ABA are trying to make it fit everything now. But traditionally, that's not what you would do for a movement disorder. You would have some kind of movement therapy, maybe a physiotherapist, maybe an occupational therapist. Maybe you've got some assistive devices. So she took a look at all these different things, which are all being thrown in under the big label of autism, and then said, what are the actual therapies 
that people should have if these are the things that they have. And oh yes, by the way, they're also autistic. ABA is not the answer. The behavioral pipeline for people with such a variety of needs is not the answer. Now I've done a fair amount of learning on the subject of sensory overstimulation and those who've been to my Twitter spaces, who've seen my videos will know, and it keeps on growing, that by now, uh, from my learning, I've been able to divide uh, sensory overstimulation into two different categories, depending on the etiology, with hypokalemic sensory overstimulation being the more common one. I started this path of learning from my friend Benjamin Herber, who is also autistic and who optimized her own sensory um, lifestyle, according to what we learned. I'm on a bunch of supplements because of my particular brand of um, sensory overstimulation. Now, and I could carry on about the causes of that. It's not only in autistic people, but in autistic people, the sensitivities will typically come from things like iron channel diseases or maybe from other kinds of issues. It could even be malabsorption of nutrients. It could be a head injury. We, we should not need to accept sensory overload as a given just because we're autistic. And the reason why we are accepting that is because we've been alienated by the medical community who kind of wants to cure our autism. So we start, we've been led to believe that if you're autistic, this is just a given. It's not. Other people who are not autistic also have this medical problem. And then we shy away from medical treatment for a medical problem because we think they try to cure our autism. I'm still as autistic as I was back in when did I last have sensory overload, 2015, before I started treating. And I've been in remission for all these years. Now, not everybody can achieve that. Maybe your problem is worse, but you can certainly lessen it if you actually understand the mechanism. So to get back to what's happening in ABA, what's happening with, <laughs> you know, with these uh, scientists, they make a leap from identifying a problem condition, linking it to autistic behavior, and then deciding that they need to manage the behavior. Instead of doing what the obvious thing is, if somebody has a medical problem, treat the medical problem. If somebody has changed in such a way that they just happen to be very different and they move in different ways and it's not something that you can treat necessarily, um, then just give support for somebody who's jolly disability. That's <laughs> straightforward. But these guys don't get trained in disability rights. So we have the same situation as the people who want to force cochlear implants on people who are congenitally deaf because, oh no, you know, we can't do the accommodation. We definitely can't have them doing sign language and getting to know other deaf people because that's a travesty. And so they will force uh, things which, which deaf people themselves have said is incredibly alienating. So we have the same thing happening with autistic people, people deciding that you need to treat something which actually doesn't need to be treated. And then they leave neglected the things which do need to be treated. So let's just get back to what uh, Elizabeth Torres was writing about. Here's one of the things in her research, which is very significant for autistic people going forward. Well, as you can imagine, she looking at these genes and seeing good grief, none of these things match up to ABA as the treatment for this problem, if you want to frame it as a problem. Well, in some cases you should, because some things actually are quite damaging, but you know, some of us just end up different. Um, so <laughs> ABA is not the solution to any of these things. So what is the solution or what is the approach? Well, it really differs from person to person. There is no one size fits all therapy for autism. All that we can say is that autistic people need support. Now, this also leads in terms, or at least it, it, it fits in with her approach to diagnosing autism. Currently it's um, suck out of your thumb really. Are you autistic or not? People look at a piece of paper, uh, you know, go through a couple of very superficial um, common denominators, which for a bunch of very diverse people, and then throw you into this autism bucket, even though it's very much external observation. And do you really match these criteria? And if I think that you make too much eye contact, then no, I don't give you your autism diagnosis. It's, it's very arbitrary. She's taking a look at it from a precision perspective. So what she's learned is that um, autistic people, if you take all of us together, there are common movement, micro movement, signatures that we have 
that should be measurable if you put wearable devices onto people. And what I mean by them is like if somebody is developing Parkinson's disease, for example, they also have tiny, tiny movements that you can't really detect with the human eye. And there's a certain like movement flux that happens there where you can say, yeah, you're starting to develop Parkinson's. Okay, so in the same way, the various autisms also have movement signatures where if you were to put people onto, you know, wire them up to some things, you can actually say, yes, no, you're autistic or you're not autistic, as simple as that. And then it's not arbitrary anymore. It's not up to the silly diagnostician and their level of ignorance about autism. You would actually be able to just measure autism. Simple test. Calibrate the machinery. Okay. Bing, spits out a result. You're autistic. Now, what happens after that? Do you need therapy? Well, it depends. I mean, it, you could just get like, okay, you're autistic, so, you know, that's it. Bye-bye, you know, go meet some autistic friends and talk about the lifestyle, enjoy your special interests, whatever. What if you have some kind of a, a movement issue? What if you have something, some condition, which, besides making you autistic, also has an illness associated with it? And this happens sometimes, you know, you could be autistic and have seizures. If you think of something like de George syndrome, when you get diagnosed with de George syndrome, you, you're autistic, but you have a heart issues as well. And you have a couple of other things you could have too. One of my autistic friends has two sons who have de George syndrome. One of them also has Down syndrome. So there's some health things that they need to optimize. So your, your diagnosis, if we want to use medical framing of it, rather than your identification, which might be a better word, but let's, let's go with a medical word for now, just we could switch that so your diagnosis of autism should actually in include your overall health status really and see for the way that you are wired if we're going to use that framing um has the following potential issues in it and to live your best life and to you know be happy to contribute to society in the way that you want to to have good support of friendships and you know we live with the rights that anybody has your health would be important and we need to work towards the best health that's possible for every person and some people are not going to have great health but they can have better rather than worse so potentially you can actually just like anybody who's an athlete and who straps on you know things measuring their heart rate or measuring their number of steps taken per day so we could strap on some wearable devices in the future which will tell us ahead of time, ah, you know, like two days from now, you're going to have a meltdown coming if you do not, for example, supplement your magnesium. Or, you know, you need to get up and breathe and have a drink of water. I'm making it a little bit more prescriptive than it is, but you could have ongoing, like, diagnostics of your, your, your health, which would make a lot more sense than people going with arbitrary what other people see to be behavioral symptoms you could have health optimization what it leads to as well is the kinds of therapies which would be useful for you ah oh, okay this person seems to have a, a progressive condition which is leading to less and less and less um, purposeful movement okay so what they might need is they may, might need to have something that goes into the back of their head that'll help them over there um, this person is um, uh, having a struggle with a lot of anxiety. Let's see what's happening there. Oh, maybe they should have their cortisol tested. Maybe they've got an adrenal problem. Those are the kinds of things that we could help. Is this an autism cure? No, not at all. I mean, go and visit the New Jersey Autism Center of Excellence website if you want to. Or Dr. Elizabeth Torres has her own, uh, also uh, her own research site for things that she does that are not associated with that. But you, you're not going to be looking at autism cures anyway they're just taking a look at optimizing what you have and that certainly means no ABA so what's the path forward for all of this well we need to take a look at who do we work with really when we're going to be working with scientists and which scientists do we support and which not many of us don't know a lot about biological research so when these things like spectrum 10k come out and so on everybody's up in arms about the eugenics aspect of it but there are other aspects which are problematic which are beyond that even when they say, no, we're not trying to rub your foot face of the earth, and then they clearly are. Um, it's the fact that they're sticking you into a behavioral pipeline, which has nothing to do with the science. But they somehow use it to justify the behavioral pipeline, even though it makes no sense. Um, 
they're using it for leverage. They're using it for drug development. They're using it for developing drugs to make you behave differently. That is in being done by people. Autistica are involved in those things. Um, the guys from Cambridge, uh, Baron Cohen, are involved in that. Gershwin is involved. They're involved in drug development for making you make eye contact, for making you do behave non-autistically. It may not be your greatest need. Maybe you need sensory optimization. Maybe you need to have acceptance. Maybe you need to have a different way of teaching. Maybe you need help for some other, other health problem. But they're looking at behavior as a target for drug development for drug com companies like Roche, in which, by the way, the sponsoring organization for um, a Full Spectrum 10K project, uh, which is the Wellcome Trust, they have stakes in pharmaceutical companies so we need to be taking a look at autism research and all the science in respect of aut autistic health from a human rights perspective now my uh, fellow activist karen morioki and i are very very adamant about the united nations convention on the rights of people with disabilities as is my fellow activist Sekwande Matenjwa, and that is the angle that we believe that all of this should be coming from. You start out with the people who have a specific disability, in this case autistic people, ask us what we want. And the, we, you get many autistic people who say like, I like being autistic, but boy would I like to be rid of sensory overload. Good, focus on that. Because people like me who are health activists shouldn't be the ones telling you that you've got to take a look at what's happening in terms of your magnesium and potassium. You should be having doctors do that. You should be having autism researchers doing what we want. I'm not a molecular and cell biologist. I had to do the reading to discover what all this is about. They should be doing it. They should be listening to what we want researched. If we want research done on bullying and how we can stop people from bullying others rather than stop us from being bullied as if we have to manage that because society is so terrible then the research should be done on the things which we want done and i would urge discussions with anybody who's in health anybody who's in the biological side of autism research should center around the united nations convention on the rights of people with disabilities what are you researching is it in line with that are you asking First and foremost, and I'm not asking whether well, but are we, our research is checked by ethics panels or whatever. That's not it. Are you asking autistic people what they want researched? Are you asking your autistic clients what they want optimized in terms of their health? Or have you decided that you just want to treat their autism? It's a human rights issue. And the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities gives us the right to health if people choose to implement it. I'm done with supporting people who say they want to do something for autistic people, but who are not interested in human rights.